First of all, the title. I would like to add a word to it. I would like to add the word global indifference. Because without it, all the other threats would not succeed. But when we have a global indifference, when the whole world is indifferent to our problems, to our experiences, to our hopes, to our joy occasionally, then we are in trouble, because then the world would be perverted. <coughs> Second, whenever we discuss anything that touches the Jewish people and Jewish history, we must always approach it from the, almost from the historiosophical viewpoint. It's always a door, a philosophical door to our destiny. Now, I almost became part of Durban One. Kofi Annan was Secretary General, and uh, he created a group called, believe it or not, a group of the eminent persons and that group was supposed to give its small auspices to Durban One. Kofi Annan called me and I said, of course, how can I say no? And then I got the program. I think, I think even Ann sent it to me. When I read the program, I called up Kofi and I said, Kofi, I'm terribly sorry, I must resign. Because he had already announced the composition of the group. My name was on it. He said, why? I said, I have to see you. I came to see him, and I said, look, I cannot, because I realize now from the program that uh, Durban One, which is supposed to be a convention or a conference against anti-Semitism, is becoming a conference of anti-Semitism. Oh, no, he said, you come and speak. I said, I am not going, and I resigned in protest for my membership. <laughs> and I told Kofi, I said, we, we were very friends, we were good friends when he was Secretary General. I said, I'm sure that it will be a blemish on the UN and an embarrassment to you as his Secretary General. I must tell you that he is an honest man because he went to Durban and he sent me a message. He said, Eli, you were right. Now, what do we do? If 9-11 if would not have happened, that day and that week would have carried Durban on its front pages. Because the scandal was so atrocious. To have a Durban which is simply destined and directed and inspired by hatred toward the Jewish state and the Jewish people, it surely would have been the subject discussed in every home, at every meeting of all good people. But because of 9-11, of course, that became the front page. Now, one thing is clear. What is clear to me, anyway, that anti-Semitism is still a subject that we must deal with. And to me, it's a source of astonishment. I was convinced that at least one success can be attributed to the tragedy of our people. That after Auschwitz, there would be no anti-Semitism anyway. And I would say from the viewpoint of logic, if Auschwitz didn't cure the world of anti-Semitism, what could and what will? After all, Auschwitz could happen not because anti-Semitism was its only uh, motive, but without it, it would have happened. There were other elements, no doubt, political and economical and racial. But surely, without anti-Semitism, there would have been no Auschwitz. And yet, immediately it's there. 
I thought it would take maybe 10 generations to come back. But then anti-Semitism actually never disappeared. When you are a student of history, or the history of literature, you are shocked to discover, even among the greatest writers, both in France and in Russia, it's Dostoevsky or Moras, the greatest writers, you find anti-Semitism in them. In the 30s, my God, in the 30s, anti-Semitism. And some of them are great. So how could you combine greatness and hatred? Well, we are an exception. We have always been. And of course, anti-Semites denounced our feeling of superiority. But then I learned, at least in my lifetime, never to allow the enemy to define my Jewishness. I am defined as a Jew because we are all children of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and students of Rabbi Akiva and, and students of the great Baal Shem Tov. That defines me, not the enemy. The enemy may do whatever he wants, whatever they want. I will not allow them to touch the substance, the core of my identity, my inner identity, which is simply I am the son of the Jewish people. Why then do they go on? Because they are convinced that if they were to go on and on and on, somehow it will not only change the world, it will change us in our own eyes. That really, are they that stupid to think that because of what they say, I will change? Stupidity. Then anti-Semitism is stupid. To say, what do they say? That we control the whole world. As you say in Yiddish, alibi. <laughs> I wish it were true. When they do that, I say to them, give us the world for one century. I promise you that when we will give it back, it won't be worse. <laughs> but they believe it. They believe that we control Wall Street naturally. We control all the theaters. We control the, the literature. We control everybody. Now, mind you, there was a time in one land at, pla at, at last and at least, the Weimar Republic. The Weimar Republic really had everything controlled by Jews. Who was the director of the best theater? A Jew. Who was in the bank? Nationally a Jew. Who controlled the most important newspapers? Jews. So for a few years, somehow, they did what they thought they were doing. And that, of course, ended right away. For 12 years, they were right. And then came Hitler. How is one to explain the eternity of anti-Semitism? A religious Jew would say, Missinai, it comes from the hatred of the Jew, comes literally from Sinai, which means the moment God gave the law to the Jewish people at Sinai, Together with the law came the hatred of those who were receiving the law. So old? Because it's true. Anti-Semitism became universal. Which means they accused us of being too rich or too poor, too universalist or too nationalist, too intelligent or too stupid, to learn it or to ignorant, it's always too much. Somehow we live at a, at a, in a stage, at a stage of excess. Whatever we are, we are excessively what we are. Whatever we do, we ex do it excessively in order to be perfect. So what then can we do to stop anti-Semitism? We tried by assimilation. We tried, it didn't work. We, are still, we remained a people, a rich with its heritage. We tried everything, but it didn't work. Its identity, but the identity was in crisis. The identity was the object. We always did the right thing. We defined ourselves from within. Now, on the other hand, you may ask, 
how come that anti-Semitism was so universal? Stalin and Hitler had nothing in common, except both of them hated Jews. Why? I don't know. Anti-Semitism as much is as much a mystery as our very existence. Then we go further. Zionism. Herzl was naive. He was convinced that the Jewish state would end anti-Semitism because he became a Zionist only thanks to the Dreyfus trial, which he covered as a journalist. And when he saw and heard the crowds in Paris shouting death to the Jews, he said, what do you mean, I'm a Jew. They want my death? What have I done? Literally, that's how he thought. He writes about it in the Judenstadt. That's how he came to, they hate us because we have no state. So let's have a state. He said, I said he was naive because it's not true. We have a state, but now the state is being hated. So what did he achieve? And there we say, no matter what, the price is worth it. It's a good price, a high price, but nevertheless, here we are. Now we can come furthermore. And we can say what's happening today. What's happening today is a disgrace. What you heard from Ambassador Bolton is so correct. The United Nations was a great idea, after all, to bring together representatives from the entire world. Only read, read what, what the, the, the principles of the establishment of the United Nations were giving equality to everybody, restore the dignity of every person and every group. After all, these are great, great ideas. But they have perverted it, which means they used even the virtues, its own virtues, against a group, a great, against the community. And who are we? We are, after all, the only people of antiquity to have survived antiquity, the only one. There were the Babylonians and the Romans and the Greeks disappeared, the ancient ones. Only we alone survived. How did we do that? Now, they hate us because of that. Sometimes you have the feeling, especially com communism did it, said, what do you want from us? We want the whole world to be saved. And you speak to us about Jews. So leave us. No. We are part of history. And according to Rabbi Yudha Alevi, we are the heart of history. When we hurt, it means the whole world is hurting. If something is being done to us, it is actually touching or destroying the whole world. But nevertheless, the fact that we are here is also a cause of anti-Semitism. For them, if we were to disappear, there would be no more anti-Semitism. And that's what they say. Assimilate, do that. Do. Now here we are facing the United Nations. And to our shame, there is a man who is going to speak to there tomorrow. And there I would like Two things. I would like to see that when he goes up to speak, the entire hall should be empty. <laughs> Just like that. Everybody should go up. And I would like some second thing, that when he leaves the hall and goes out into the street, there should be a few New York policemen waiting for him, and arrest him. <laughs> Just like that, to arrest him. And say, you are in charge with an intent of committing crimes against humanity. And they should read to him his own words. And therefore, we are arresting you. And you shall be sent to uh, Strasbourg or to The Hague. 
to face an international court charged with this crime. Because this crime, Ambassador Gold will tell you that legally, the only one that the intent to commit this crime is already criminal. And charged with this crime, he must go there. What has been done to Pinochet should be done to him. Now, will uh, the United Nations protest let them? Ahmadinejad had the audacity to become a Holocaust denier on one hand, simply to say it hasn't happened, and he continues, it will happen, and he will be responsible for it. This is what he wants. He wants to bomb or to destroy Tel Aviv and enter the history of Islam as the one who committed such a deed, a criminal deed, but a great deed, against the people, the Jewish people. And therefore, whatever and you do here and we are all doing here, really is, I think it's important. Will it help? I hope so. And since uh, we are going towards Rosh Hashanah, we are all supposed to do what we call Kashbona Nefesh, the accounting of our soul. What have we done the last year? That's very important. These are important moments. I always believe, and that's my profound belief, that life is not made of years, but of moments. And these meetings that we are participating in should be moments, special moments. And I will tell you one of my favorite stories. Whenever we come to impossible missions, before extraordinary moments, I think of this story, that once upon a time, there was a sage, very courageous, who believed human rights for everybody, there is dignity in every soul, there is goodness in every human being. And therefore, he chose a place where none of these exist, a kind of Sodom, modern Sodom. So he came there, and he began walking the streets, one town after another, one street after another, saying, men and women, remember who we are, remember our duty, remember our, the dangers facing us, remember, remember, remember. In the beginning, because there was no such person who has ever spoken like that, they came to hear him. He went on. One day, a child stopped him. He said, poor stranger, you shout and you shout and you shout, and nobody listens. Doesn't it bother you? He said, yes. Then why do you go on shouting? He said, look, my child, in the beginning I was convinced that if I were to shout loud enough, I will change them. But now I realize I shout and shout and shout, not because I will ever change them, impossible, but I don't want them to change me. Isn't that the definition, the best definition of what a Jew is? Thank you and Shana Tova. <laughs>